seated. I love the Palm Sunday hymns. They're always a joy to sing and wonderful to think about the words and what a delight also to hear the, the choir sing a few moments ago all hail the power of Jesus name medley with the different melodies to which those great words have been said. Thank you choir and thank you children also for singing when his salvation bringing. So we appreciate that, and it certainly brings praise to God. Let's join together for a moment of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as once again we look into your word and to these portions of scripture, which we have just read a few moments ago, we pray that you will open our eyes to the glory of Jesus Christ, our sovereign Lord, the one who is the King of Israel, the one who is the King of the Jews, the one who is the ruler of the nations, the one who is the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, the one to whom all glory and praise belongs. Bless your word to our hearts, Father. Keep us from hardening our hearts. Cause us to hear, to believe, and to obey. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now just a moment ago we read two of the portions of Scripture which deal specifically in the Gospels with the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of the great King the city where Messiah will rule and reign for a thousand years, literally, here on this earth, as prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures, as confirmed by our Lord Jesus Christ, as promised again in the New Testament, in the epistles, as seen gloriously portrayed in the book of Revelation. A major theme of the scriptures is the return of Christ, and the sitting of Messiah upon the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. Magnificent promises in Scripture. And in our texts today, we see him coming into Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, riding upon a donkey, upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass, as he comes in to offer himself as the messianic king. When we read the narrative of the triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, we discover that it is not only contained in all three of these synoptic gospels, each one of them adding some additional information that relates specifically to the theme of that gospel, but we also find it in the Gospel of John. Now, as you know from sermons that I've preached in the past, there are only select, specific, limited number of incidences in the life of Christ that are recorded in all three synoptic Gospels and in the Gospel of John. When you find something that is in both the synoptics and the Gospel of John, you find something that God is specifically and directly focusing our attention on because of its central importance. And thus it is with the triumphal entry. We've read the two passages, or at least portion of Matthew and most of the passage out of Luke concerning the triumphal entry. But I want to read you also from both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John because it has some additional information specifically related to the purposes of those Gospels and their exposition of who Jesus is and what he did, that is, his person and his work, so that we have a complete picture of our Lord in all of the different aspects of his character. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, 
gives us additional information concerning that triumphal entry. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. Of course, we see the omniscience of our Lord Jesus Christ in this, not only in knowing that there will be a colt tied, but knowing that this particular colt will never have been ridden before. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them there that stood said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him. And he sat on him and spread many their garments in the way. And others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now we have a more complete quotation here than we see in either of the other two gospels. References to Psalm 118 in those portions of text. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now eventide was come, he went out into Bethany with the twelve. The Gospel of John adds additional things to that and also tells us of the cleansing of the temple second time. John 12, verse 9. Here we find much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, that is, at the house of Mary and Martha. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. We see a foreshadowing, a picture of what is about to happen. We see a very small type of what Jesus is about to do after his death. And we find people who know about this. And they come to see Jesus, the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. We're specifically told here in John, because this is going to come up in a moment as we look at the children praising and singing, Glory to our Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that they knew that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and they could not deny it. And so they are plotting not only against Jesus, but they are plotting against Lazarus to kill him, to stop the testimony, to keep people from believing on Christ. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. Interesting, though they had walked with him for three years, they did not understand. They had heard the master himself, God incarnate, teaching them and expounding the scriptures, which all point to him. But they understood not. Do you understand this, that you cannot understand the scriptures unless your heart is opened by the Holy Spirit of God, that you can read words without having an understanding of them from the divine viewpoint. Here are the disciples participating in the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. .9. Here are the disciples with the one 
who is God in the flesh, who has taught them for three years, and yet they don't understand yet. They will later. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, remember that phrase, when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. So here is some additional information John is giving to us about what's happening during the triumphal entry. There's a large group of people with him who are waving the palm branches, strawing their clothing down on the way in front of the donkey as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, who have seen Lazarus, who know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, who were there when Mary and Martha were weeping, when Jesus went to the grave and cried, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was bound with grave clothes came forth. These are people who have seen. We discover there are some of them who had believed. We'll see that in the text in a moment. Not only had they seen it, not only had somebody gone back and told the scribes and Pharisees in Sanhedrin, but there were those among them who supported Jesus' heart and soul who were declaring that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead and this must be our Messiah. That's what it says here. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. This is the middle of the triumphal entry. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard how he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Prevail, Perceive ye how he, he prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Interesting, here are the Jewish leaders worried that people are following the Messiah. But we see an interesting statement in verses 20 and 21. We find that there are those from the Hellenized Jews who have come to worship at the feast. We begin to see a picture of what's going to happen in the book of Acts. There were certain Greeks also among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. What a magnificent statement that last statement is. Sir, we would see Jesus. Years ago, when I went to the Stony Brook School for Boys on Long Island, on the pulpit, inscribed in gold lettering, were those words to remind every man who stood in that pulpit that there was one thing and one thing only that must be preached, and that is Christ. It read across the front, Sir, we would see Jesus. In your life, is that true? In your life, as you walk in this world, and others are watching you to see who you are and what you represent, and who say to you, Sir, we would see Jesus, do they see Jesus in your life? After all, he must be the center focus of who you are and what you do the one who redeemed you with his blood, the one who is making his entry here as the messianic king. Sir, we would see Jesus. And all the scriptures point to him. Now, did you notice something out of those three portions of text that I read to you? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Only one of those four mentions the children specifically. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Number one, children were meant to be seen and not heard. Number two, 
This is the temple. What are children doing? Singing and crying praise to God in the temple. That holy place. Which they, in their perverted view, viewed as more important than the Messiah himself. They were focused on buildings. Oh, how often we see that. And what is the charge brought against Christ? What is the charge brought against Stephen when they stone him? What are the charges that the Jews so focused on it was related to the temple? He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it again. They didn't understand. He spoke of the temple of his body, but they were focused on the buildings. Dear people, focus on Jesus, not on the buildings. And he said to them, that is Jesus now speaking, answering this, don't you realize how bad this is? They're displeased with this. Jesus says unto them, and, and, he, and said they unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? That's an indictment. Jesus Christ speaking to those who were the religious leaders. Jesus speaking to those who thought they knew the law. Those who thought they knew the writings of David. Those who thought they knew the prophets. Those who thought they sat in the seat of Moses. And so they're the ones who are the official interpreters of Scripture. And Jesus says, All right, have you never read this portion of Scripture, which is a messianic psalm, Psalm 8? We'll see some of it in a moment about these children. Jesus is quoting Psalm 8 here at this point. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. That was one of the two things that displeased the chief priests and scribes. Number one, it says they saw, verse 15, the, scribe, the priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. What has the text told us that was right before this? It told us that there were people who believed on Jesus because they'd seen Lazarus raised from the dead. And somebody who had seen Lazarus raised from the dead went and told the priests and the scribes. And they probably sent out more, probably of themselves, to go see this Lazarus. They had seen the miracles of Jesus through his ministry. And they couldn't deny them. They saw the wonderful things that he did. The second thing is, it says they heard. They heard the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, and they were sore displeased. Two things that displeased them. The miracles of Jesus displeased them. And they couldn't deny what they'd seen with their own eyes. You know what, folks? That makes them accountable. Number two, they heard the children crying, Hosanna to the son of David. How interesting. The children had more insight into the person and work of Christ than the learned doctors of the law. And thus they were accountable for what they heard. Hosanna, an interesting word, Hoshienu. It means save now or save us, thou son of David. Hoshienu is Hosanna. Do you understand also what they said there? Thou son of David. That is a messianic title. The son of David. We find it in multiple passages of prophecy in the Old Testament. We find it clearly stated as referring to Christ as the Messiah in the New Testament. The one who is the son of David. Save now, son of David. That's an ascription to Jesus of the title of Messiah, the son of David. Something else we learn interesting out of this passage about the children crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. The children obviously had parents. I suspect that those parents were part of this procession that was going along. 
They wouldn't be letting their little kids just run out in the streets and do whatever they wanted to do. It's quite different than it is today where you see children wandering around at all times of day and night and hanging out on corners and doing drugs and all that other wretched wickedness that we see in our own country, getting involved in immorality and doing things that they want to do regardless of what the parents want them to do. The children had parents. The children obviously had been taught about the coming of the Messiah and been taught specific passages, such as the passage out of Psalm 118, which is a specific prophecy about these events. These are children who are not ashamed to give him, our Lord Jesus, honor and praise. Though we find that later on some of their parents are afraid to do so. The children had a yearning for the deliverance of Israel, though they probably did not know the primary yearning of their parents was for political deliverance from the Romans. The children may not have had a deeper understanding of what Hosanna, save now, referred to, but God frequently uses unknowing instruments to accomplish his purposes. As they're crying out, Hoshienu, as they're crying out, Hosanna, deliver us, son of David. They may not have understood the full implications. But you know, God uses instruments who do not know they are being used to fulfill his word and to fulfill his purpose. I can prove that to you. Just the chapter before, it tells to us, in chapter 11, verses 47 through 53, the chief priests are here plotting the death of Christ. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. They were displeased with the miracles that Jesus had done. Remember our text. Triumphal entry. Jesus coming into the city. They're displeased with two things. Number one, the miracles that Jesus did. Number two, the words of the children. They saw and they heard. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Ah. Their worry was about themselves. They didn't really care about the Bible. They didn't really care about Moses and the law and the prophets. They didn't care about what was written of the Messiah in the Psalms. They cared about me and me only. It was a self-centered interest. And one of them named Caiaphas. Now listen to this carefully. One of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. The end justifies the means. Now listen to this verse. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, he prophesied, Caiaphas, the wicked, unbelieving, atheistic Caiaphas, prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation, that is the nation of Israel only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Does Jesus frequently use unknowing instruments to accomplish his purposes, even as he did with Caiaphas, who hated Jesus? Yes. And though the children may have not been doctors of theology, though they may not have understood much more than the basics of the Old Testament, yet what they did was fulfill specific prophecies concerning the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sovereign hand of God controlled even the thoughts, plans, and mouth of Caiaphas, the leader of the plot to murder Jesus, all according to the infinite and wise and immutable counsels of God. But you know, the children here are partaking in something that is even 
more amazing. We see that Jesus makes the chief priests and scribes undeniably accountable following the declaration of the children and based upon the declaration of the children. Those Pharisees and scribes might be suspicious of the miracles because even Satan can produce miraculous happenings. They might have been scornful of the testimony of the children for a child had no legal standing at that time and certainly no degrees in the law. But when they criticize Jesus for what the children have said, what does he do? What does he do? How does he respond? He points them to scripture. Dear people, when there's a challenge, that's where you go back every time you must. When there is a challenge, point them to scripture. God says, my word shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I have sent it. Sometimes he sends it for salvation. Sometimes he sends it for judgment. Point them to scripture. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did with the devil in Matthew chapter 4. At the three temptations of Christ, he always pointed the devil back to, it is written. It's not somebody's big idea. It is the very word of God, and the word of God is what has authority, not the word of man. It is written. When they criticized Jesus, he pointed them to the scripture, the very thing that they piously claimed to believe, the very thing that they piously taught in the temple and in the synagogues, the very thing that they blindly read by rote every Sabbath day. Here's what he said. Uh, they said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read? The answer is obviously they had read this because there is a system of reading in the Old Testament scriptures and certainly from the book of Isaiah. It was on the very day and very time that Jesus walked into the scripture and the minister handed unto him the scriptures to read that he read Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2 in the cycle of readings. He read to them that he had fulfilled the great messianic prophecies of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Yes, they had read it. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? Jesus is quoting Psalm 8 to them here. Psalm 8 too says, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now the children of Israel as a nation were looking for someone who would be stronger than their enemies, someone who might stop their enemies, someone who would be an avenger on their enemies. Three things in that verse. Have you never read it? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. It's a quotation of Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. The children have been crying out, to the son of David. Who was it that wrote Psalm 8? We don't have any question about it. We know for sure. Listen to Psalm 8, 1. To the chief musician upon Gittit, a psalm of David. O Lord, notice it's all capitals, that's Jehovah. O Jehovah, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. We've been studying for 17 weeks now the names of God. And all the names that center around that focal central name of Yahweh. The name Jehovah, the name Lord, and the incredible things that God reveals about himself through his names. And he's given his name, as he says to Moses, as a memorial unto all generations. Here's David talking about the same thing. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now, I hope you were paying attention when I read the quote 
out of the Gospels concerning the babes and sucklings, I hope you notice the difference in Matthew 21.16 and in Psalm 1.2. Did you notice that one of them, after the mouths of babes and sucklings, says, Thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the avenger. And the other one says, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. And some people have tried to point to that and say, Oh, you see, Jesus didn't quote it quite right. Nonsense. Jesus is the God of heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the center of scripture. What is the answer when there are those who challenge that difference? What you see is Jesus summarizing the main point of Psalm 8 in the four words, Thou hast perfected praise. He quotes the first phrase out of the mouth of babes and sucklings to identify that Psalm 8 is a prophecy concerning himself. Then he summarizes the theme of Psalm 8, as we'll see in a moment, in that phrase, Thou hast perfected praise. The theme of Psalm 8 is stated in verse 1, which I read just a moment ago. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. That is a statement of praise. Thou hast perfected, that has brought to a complete conclusion. Thou hast finished off this statement. The statement of praise covers two things. Number one, the name of Jehovah. Our Lord, as the sovereign over the earth. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And number two, a statement of praise to the one whose glory is above the heaven, who has set thy glory above the heavens. When we tie together these two things at once with the declaration of the children, we see what Jesus is doing as he did on many occasions when he quoted the scriptures and proved to them and stopped their mouths, proved to them that he was the Messiah and they could not speak against it. You remember the challenges that were brought to him. There were the challenges about, well, shall we pay tribute money to Caesar? And he said, bring me a penny. And they brought him a penny and he looked at it and he pointed to the thing and he says, now, tell me about this penny. Um, whose name and superscription is there on? Who's got a picture on that? Caesar. Okay, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and to God the things that belong to God. Hmm. Not much they can say about that. That was the coinage of a human realm. They challenged him concerning the resurrection because, you see, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection and... The majority of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees. They were the secular humanists in religious garb of their day. So they challenged him and they gave him the little narrative about, well, there was this guy who got married. And, uh, you know, he died. And he didn't leave any children. So his brother married under Leveret Law, uh, you know, where the brother is supposed to marry the widow to raise up children unto his brother and all that, going back to the Law of Moses. And... Uh, they were married for a while, he died. She married the third brother, he died. And all seven of the brothers ended up marrying her and they all died and they didn't leave any children. And so in the resurrection, which they did not believe in, whose wife shall she be? Jesus again pointed them back to the scriptures. And he pointed them back to the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Haven't you ever read... What God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. He puts it in what we would call present tense. It's not exactly the same in Hebrew, but puts it in present tense. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, Moses is at least 600 years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They'd been dead for a long time. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. That means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Fascinating implications concerning the inspiration of Scripture at that point also. Concerning the way that Jesus, on many occasions, tied both his deity and the events that were happening in the future at that time to himself on a literal understanding of the text. 
Every word, every letter, every part of the letter, not a jot or a tittle, shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled, Matthew 5.17. Every part of the scripture is fully inspired, and we've been talking about that in the preservation of scriptures in our discussions of the names of Jehovah. Dear people, the scripture is a unit. It all ties together. It stands or falls together. And the person of our Lord Jesus Christ the living word stands or falls. At the same time, the scripture stands or falls, for they are both the word of God, the written word, the living word. Specific parallel by God in scripture. But I must get back to my text. So we find here, tying these together, Jesus is claiming not only to be the fulfillment of the prophecy, but he is once again claiming to be both the Messiah and the personal sovereign God of Israel who has the right to rule the earth. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. And he is also claiming to be the one who is the Shekinah dweller, the one whose glory is above the heavens. Remember that phrase? Who has set thy glory above the heavens. So that in the context of John's gospel, we see that Jesus was the fulfillment of the vision of Isaiah chapter 6. Oh, he pulls it all together in a very concise nutshell as he answers the criticism of these apostate religious leaders who didn't like the children ascribing the messianic praise to Jesus. And he proves to them and declares to them that he is indeed Israel's God come in the flesh. Yes, they did not like him, them quoting about the one whose glory is above the heavens. Here's Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. This is Isaiah. He's about to have the great and glorious vision of the throne of God. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his faith. With twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door, that's the temple, moved with the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now listen to the last phrase, because you're going to hear it again. You're going to see it again in the Gospel of John. Mine eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of armies, the one whose name as the Lord of hosts we have studied. He saw the one who is the Lord of hosts. We've seen that name refers to Jesus. Do we find that someplace here in our text? This Palm Sunday text, John 12 specifically states that Isaiah saw the vision of Jesus Christ and his glory at the point of the text concerning Jesus beginning with the triumphal entry. We'll see it in a second. Speaking of Jesus, John quotes three different prophecies concerning Christ from the book of Isaiah. And the third quotation is from Isaiah 6. John says that Isaiah saw Jesus. Listen to this. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And we see that being the accusation against the Scribes and Pharisees and rulers, they saw, but they didn't believe. They heard, but they didn't believe. That the saying, and here's the first prophecy, of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake. Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The very next verse, here we have the second prophecy, to which John refers. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah says again, Esaias, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. We find judgmental blindness, divine judgmental blindness, on those who consistently rejected the testimony of Christ. Listen to the third. These things said Esaias when he saw his, that is the glory of Jesus, his glory, and spake 
of him. Isaiah, in each of these passages, is prophesying things about Christ. So when you get to the final one, which is the great glorious vision of Isaiah chapter 6, you cannot say, oh, well, that's referring to something else. John specifically says the Isaiah 6 vision of the Lord sitting on his throne of glory, surrounded by the seraphim, the burning ones, the seraphim, the burning ones, and crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, that the one who was the throne sitter was Jesus in his glory. That sends chills down my spine. Oh, people, we serve a mighty God, and that's the one who came to earth. The one who, meek and lowly, riding on an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass, came into Jerusalem to offer himself as the messianic king and to offer the kingdom. Oh, how externally everything seemed to be fine on that day. And yet, less than a week later, they crucified him. That's a sad commentary on how short a time it takes to become a coward for your faith. Less than a week later, the religious leaders were able to manipulate the death of Christ. Even though we read in verses 42 and 43, it says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Dear people, this is in the context of the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And less than a week later, not just the people, those lowly ones who don't get to vote on anything, but there were people in the Sanhedrin who let the bitter, murderous, hateful, Leaders control the vote so that Christ would be crucified. Are you ashamed of Christ? Do you try to hide the fact that you're a Christian? Oh, dear people, Christ went to the cross because it was foreordained by the Father. But those who participated were personally responsible, both those like Judas and Caiaphas, and most sadly, those who believed on him. God is sovereign. God predestinates all that comes to pass for his glory. But men are accountable. The sovereignty of God is never an excuse for our sin. Let me give you that immediate context. This reference by John seeing, or Isaiah seeing the glory of Jesus that John refers to, listen to it. This is in the immediate context after John records the narrative about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Remember what Isaiah saw? He saw the glory, the Shekinah, the Shekinah. John saw the glory as well in Christ. The triumphal entry is verses 9 through 21. The statement by Jesus in verse 23, two verses later, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Next thing we find is the declaration by the Father from heaven. John 12, 28, Father, glorify thy name. And that, of course, brings us back to the names of God, which point to Jesus. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. That's immediately followed by Jesus' prophecy about his death on the cross. This is all happening as we have this triumphal entry coming into the city of Jerusalem. We find the rejection by the religious leaders of Christ spoken of next. The rejection of his miracles, the rejection of the testimony of the children. They're clearly rejecting the testimony by the Father, which was audible from heaven at that point. In verse 37, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. 
And then we find the statement of the fulfillment of the glory that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. That is the continuous narrative of the triumphal entry of Christ into the city of Jerusalem. Our time is up. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Let me summarize quickly. There is so much more. First of all, God uses weak instruments for his service, just like he used those children. By using weak things, God receives the glory for all that is accomplished, and the weak instruments have no cause to claim glory for themselves. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 1, 25 through 29. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, like the little children, confounding the so-called wise, learned doctors of the law. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God chooses weak things. You say, I can never serve Jesus. I have no talents. I have no skills. I'm a weak thing. Listen, are you weaker than the little children who sang praises to the Messiah as he went into the city of Jerusalem? You're no more weak than that. Dear people, you have sat, many of you, for many, many, many years under the proclamation of the gospel of Christ, under the teaching of the word of God. You have a blessing that they didn't have then. You now have, if you have trusted Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit. You have the illumination of the Spirit on the word of God as you study it and as he brings your understanding into it. Don't forget the remainder of Psalm 8 that Jesus quotes concerning the praise of the little children. Verses 1 and 2, which we've read, are only for an introduction. It's a short psalm, but listen to what the psalm deals with. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Thou made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, Jehovah, that's Jehovah, our Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. It's pointing us back to creation. Jesus, by being the fulfillment of this psalm is also the creator. The children are the ones who do not question that truth. It's only jaded, twisted adults who reject the doctrine of a literal six-day creation in Genesis 1 through 3. But in doing so, they reject the Christ of Scripture, presented by John in John 1, 1 through 3, and then verse 14. We beheld his glory. Same as Isaiah 6, same as Psalm 8, same as John 12. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's Jesus, the Creator, the one who is the Word of God. In Him was life. That's what God brought into this world. And the life was the light of men. And God spoke and said, Let there be light, and there was light. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Light is a manifestation of glory, a visible manifestation. And as we parallel it with the glory of God, a manifestation of the Shekinah. And there's no question about that understanding of that John 1 passage. Because verse 14 makes it clear that the Messiah, Jesus, is the one who, got, who is God and who manifests the glory of God. The word was made flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. John 12. This said Isaiah when he spake of him and saw his glory. Isaiah 6. Isaiah sees the glory of God and falls down to worship because he sees the one of whom that passage speaks. Jesus on his throne. We beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, the little children sang, cried out, a testimony to the name of Jehovah 
and a testimony to the glory of God. Remember, that was the statement of praise for two things that we saw in Psalm 8.1. The name of Jehovah, our Lord, as the sovereign over the earth. And two, the one whose glory is above the heavens. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. I'm going to leave you with just one other great promise and prophecy concerning children giving praise to God. It's also from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 59, 21. Written specifically to the Jewish people. Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee. That's Isaiah. And my words which I have put in thy mouth. Isaiah. Shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, children, grandchildren, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. We see that manifested on Palm Sunday so long ago. Have you never read, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? That's the great promise to the faithful believers in Israel. It was fulfilled in the mouths of the babes and sucklings, and there are still those of the children of Israel today who have not forgotten their Messiah, who bear his name, and who bear his praise. May it even so be with us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word and for its power. Amazing to see how many portions of scripture are tied together, and they point to Jesus. There is no question you have proven that he is the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world, the one who by his power made heaven and earth and who reigns in glory above them all, the one who will fulfill his promises literally, precisely, and specifically both to Israel and to us. For this we thank you and pray that we might never be ashamed of his holy name. For we pray it in the name which is above every name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.